Okay, so anyone who is watching now, sorry for the delay and the technical difficulties. This is our first webinar, so thanks for bearing with us if you're still here. Um, so I'm going to be hosting the webinar for today. We will have five speakers. At the moment we have four, so I'm hoping the fifth will log in shortly. Um, I'm just going to give you all a brief introduction to how this webinar is going to work um, and some key definitions which you might need if you're unaware of the work that we're doing currently. And then Milena in Croatia will kick off with a more detailed introduction and a summary of what's going on there at the moment. And then we will go one by one to different areas on the Balkan route where everyone will give updates and information on the situation. I will then ask some questions to prompt um, a more general discussion. And then from that point on, you can just start to type questions into the chat and I will read them out to whoever. If you, have, if you want to dedicate your question to a specific person, you can just put it in brackets. If it's more general, then I'll just read it to everybody. Um, okay, so first of all, this is a webinar from Border Violence Monitoring Network, which if you don't know, we're an alliance of grassroots organizations and NGOs who are working to document, expose and advocate for the cessation of cross-border pushbacks, um, general border violence practices. We use a shared database to publish first-hand testimonies of pushbacks, which um, will be available on the description link. Um, and we're working across the Balkan route in Greece. So that kind of covers a whole range of countries in that area. Um, if you're really new to the subject, then I'll tell you what a pushback is to start with. So pushbacks are the informal expulsions of individuals or groups back to another country. So any state has the right to repatriate individuals or send them back to a safe third country. But pushbacks are when this happens without any kind of procedural guarantees or safeguards. Um, often there's violence involved, there's theft, there's a whole plethora of human rights violations. Um, also throughout this, to refer to the groups that we are speaking of, we will use the term people on the move, which is a very broad demographic, which encompasses refugees, migrants, and other transit communities who navigate borders. So we're not sp speaking specifically about any kind, we're talking about this kind of broad general group. Um, so now I will hand over to Milena and she will continue with the more detailed introduction of the work that we're doing. Hi to all, uh, thank you Hope for the intro. Uh, so my name is Milena and I serve as the president of Are You Serious, which is a grassroots initiative of Croatian citizens that turned into a big solidarity movement in 2015. Over the past five years, our initiative united hundreds of people of different backgrounds, different political views, and together we are an registered NGO uh, that provides direct humanitarian aid, develops integration programs, monitors human rights violations, and advocates legal treatment of refugees and migrants, or as Hope just said, people on the move at the margins of Europe. One of the projects that we are involved in is the Border Violence Monitoring Network, uh, together with our partners from Nonem Kitchen, Regardu, Infocolpa, Center for Peace Studies, Mobile Info Team, and other organizations that monitor abuses in Greece and Western Balkans. So throughout the route. Uh, in this network, I serve as the advocacy coordinator. So as Hope said, today I will present some of our recent findings, but let's have a quick historical overview first. As many of you are aware, uh, the Balkan route has changed significantly since the legal humanitarian corridor we had in 2015. Formal closure of the borders in March 2016 forced many to seek alternative, more dangerous routes far from board, formal border crossings to which they lost access to. And it is estimated that over 50,000 people entered Serbia and Bosnia in 2019. Most of them tried to continue their journey towards Croatia or Hungary. And there on European soil, they faced violence and humiliation before being collectively expelled from the EU. We estimate that 25,000 people have been pushed back from Croatia in 2019 alone including 10,000 chain pushbacks from Slovenia. I'm sure Katya will tell you more about it. Uh, fear of violent pushbacks forced the victims further out of safety to inaccessible forests and mountain terrains. Those who experience encounters with Croatian police are talking about a lack of access to asylum procedures, severe violence, theft, and destruction of their phones, which are the only means of navigation and communication to their families and emergency services. 
Today, most of the pushbacks are taking place at the Croatian border with Unasana Canton in northern Bosnia and along the Croatian border with Serbia near the town of Shid. Croatian authorities say this cannot be proven. But as people say, when there is will, there is a way. It is not hard to find evidence of the pushbacks. As soon as you come to border areas, numerous people will be more than happy to share their stories. I'm sure Zaid will be able to tell us more about it. Many will also be able to provide evidence, including bus tickets and other items brought, bought in Croatia or even Slovenia, photos of entry points, villages and urban areas, and GPS locations of their pushbacks. In 2020, as many as 69% of people who were pushed back from Croatia told us explicitly they asked for asylum before being collectively expelled from the EU. Over the green border, it must be noted, with no due procedure and therefore no documents to prove their encounter with Croatian police. It should be said that there is no much difference between demographics of those who are trying to enter the EU and in order to ask for asylum and those who are pushed back. Over the past years, we encountered people from numerous countries, men, women, and children, everyone treated in the same way. According to our findings, 38% of victims of pushbacks were children and minors. But bear in mind that we mostly collect testimonies outside of the official camps where more single men are residing. That means that the full statistics, if they were available, would probably be even worse. And in addition to indiscriminate violence and the hunt for people on Croatian soil, racial profiling is in place all over our country. Police officers are entering buses, trains, stopping cars, and patrolling large areas in search for migrants. Such raids sometimes end up in paradoxical situations where people who are legally registered asylum seekers and have been living in Croatia for years end up being mistakenly pushed back to Bosnia. Recently, we also had a very public case of two Nigerian students with valid visas who came to Croatia to compete in a sport contest only to be illegally expelled to Bosnia based on the tone of their skin. While our government is denying such practice, more and more police officers are anonymously sharing their stories with journalists, activists and institutions. Last year, Croatian ombudswoman published a letter from whistleblowers who were describing in detail how orders are in place to expel everyone and describe the same MO that their victims are describing to our volunteers after experiencing pushbacks. This includes denied access to asylum procedures, violence, theft, destruction of their mobile phones. And it happens systematically every day and every night both in border areas and deep in Croatian soil, on territories of 20 different police administrations. Same procedure is in place on every part of 1,377 kilometers of Croatian border. And similar procedure, it should be noted, is in place in other countries that stand at European external borders, such as, for example, Hungary and, boringly, most recently, Greece. Left unsanctioned, the police violence escalating to more electric shocks, forced undressing, police dog attacks, and severe gun violence. Last November, within only 10 days, two unarmed migrants were shot by Croatian police officers in two different incidents, and one of them barely survived. The Minister of Interior described the incidents as isolated accidents, but only our small NGOs united in the Border Violence Monitoring Network managed to gather testimonies of 1,200 79 people who were threatened with guns or shot at in the past three years. And according to our findings, 19% of all recorded pushbacks from Croatia involved gun use, even against very small children and their families. In 2018, two 12-year-olds were shot in the face by Croatian police officers, and nobody is held responsible for these incidents. Instead of providing, just to quickly uh, illustrate the political climate here, instead of providing answers to questions about serious violations of human rights, in Croatia, the government is doing everything to silence those who are reporting about it. NGOs have been publicly defamed, our volunteers held for hours in police stations without formal charges and threatened with criminal prosecution. In a politically motivated trial against one of our volunteers, the Ministry of Interior even asked the court to ban our work in Croatia. And we are not the only ones facing such pressure. Ombudswoman, for example, repeatedly warned police has prevented her from investigating allegations of border violence. 
And also first aid workers and members of rescue services told us numerous times that they have been under pressure not to report violence against people on the move. So what we have now is the situation where people are passing to our country like ghosts, afraid of police, afraid of any human contact, afraid even to call ambulance when their lives are in danger from cold or exhaustion. And even when they finally break and call for help, they're pushed back. Recent pandemic brought new challenges as the pushbacks continue happening out of sight of independent border monitors or national preventive mechanisms such as Ombudswoman. It is almost impossible to estimate how many people have been pushed back from Croatia in the recent months, but reports from BVMN and its partners paint a rather grim picture about escalating violence and the new abusive trends. Nonim Kitchen, for example, was the first to recognize a new trend of tagging people with spray paint before pushing them back. And we managed to present these findings to the Ombudswoman, members of the European Parliament and other relevant actors. While our colleagues from Center for Peace Studies asked the Ministry of Interior for clarifications. Unfortunately, their questions remained unanswered and the Ministry of Interior did their best to discredit our work after publication of the spray painting incidents in major news outlets such as The Guardian. Today, several people from the Center for Peace Studies and Welcome Initiative organized a stand-in in front of the Ministry of Interior in Zagreb to demand answers and investigations. So this is one of the new developments. Another worrying trend recorded by Are You Serious involves having uh, COVID infest infected police officers in the border area. More precisely, two police officers were tested positive in Toposko Hotel facility where border guards reside during their pushback missions. And whistleblowers from the police told us that they felt the incident was mismanaged as many of them were returned to their daily tasks without any preventive measures. Victims of pushbacks from Croatia also said no preventive measures in relation to COVID-19 were in place during their apprehension and pushback. And I think we all know what would happen if a person, for example, got infected during the pushback and then returned to the cramped camp somewhere in Bosnia or Serbia. Meanwhile, what is happening deeper inside Croatian territory, open reception facilities for asylum seekers, those who are lucky enough to get the chance to ask for asylum, were put under special preventive measures with restricted access in order to prevent spreading of the virus. And this is why we weren't able to work within the camps for the past two months, but we have focused our energy into setting up online language classes for adults and educational activities for kids and instead of welcoming people in our free shop that we have in Zagreb, we have organized weekly de deliveries of NFI to the homes of refugees who live in Croatia at the moment. Uh, it should also be noted uh, that Zagreb was hit by a devastating earthquake two months ago in the middle of the COVID-related lockdown. And due to these two catastrophes, many asylum grantees also lost their job, and some of them are now at risk of homelessness. And at the moment, uh, we are setting up a fundraiser for 40 households with 65 adults and 45 children, whom we recognize as most vulnerable. And the campaign is launching on Monday, but I will be happy to share more on that later in the call. I hope this was okay for the introduction. Thanks, Milena, that was great. I think that was very detailed, so I don't need to prompt you with any more information. So next we'll be moving on to Milica, who's going to explain a bit about the situation in Serbia at the moment. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in. My name is Milica. I'm a lawyer from the organization Click Active Center for Development of Social Policies. Uh, we are an NGO from Belgrade, Serbia, which is also one of the countries at the Balkan route. Regarding the situation with um, Corona, Serbia was, as, as our government officials assured us, that there will be no outbreak of the virus here in Serbia. However, it all dramatically changed on the 5th of March when the Serbian president declared the state of emergency on the whole territory of Serbia and very soon, very sharp and strict measures were imposed. Regarding the refugees, uh, 
one of the first measures that was adopted was to close off all the camps in Serbia. Serbia has 19 camps across its territory with a capacity of 6,000 people. Before the state of emergency, there was never more than four or 5,000 people. So some of the camps were even temporarily closed because there was no need for so many people. Serbia has a lot of informal squads on the borders, both with Croatia and with Hungary. But also a lot of people are staying in Belgrade, both in the hostels, but also uh, out in the open on the construction sites, uh, near bridges, and, and so on. Uh, once the um, government adopted this measure to close off all the camps and to restrict them, to completely restrict the movement of refugees, the police uh, had a couple of um, races on Belgrade and also in the informal camps um, in Shid and in Subotica. So it resulted with all of the people who were found to be residing outside of the camps to be forcibly removed to the camps. Uh, at the end, so a few days later, more than 9,000 people were in the 19 camps. Uh, this means then um, all the camps were overcrowded, so more than 3,000 people were, were in the camps, so more than the capacities. Um, unlike probably other countries, in Serbia there were no responses from uh, the Ombudsman or the Ombudsman for the Equality. None of the courts also, including the constitutional courts, there were some initiatives before the constitutional court, but there were no replies and no responses from any, any of the public institutions. Uh, all the camps were completely closed, so none of the refugees were allowed to leave, even to go for the shops, to go to the doctors, or for any other reasons, and they were completely shut off from the rest of the world. None of the NGOs were allowed to go into the camps, uh, including legal representatives, psychosocial support, so absolutely nobody was allowed to go in. Uh, until today, there is no registered cases of COVID-19 among the refugee population. Uh, still, even after the state of emergency was uh, revoked at the beginning of May, the refugees remained uh, closed off in the camps based on the decision of the Ministry of Health. It was assessed that it's not safe either for the refugee population and for the general population in Serbia to let refugees go out. At the moment, uh, officially this decision was revoked and uh, according to the official information, refugees are allowed to leave the camps, but in practice, some of the camps are still closed or they're letting only a small number of people to leave the camp every day and they have an obligation to go back. According to the information that we have, uh, the police is still patrolling some of the places where all the informal squads were. They're also patrolling in the Belgrade so-called Afghani Park, the main point where all the refugees are gathering here in, in Belgrade. And they're still taking people forcibly to the refugee camps. Also, during the, the state, we will probably talk more about that later on, but during the, during the state of emergency, there were a lot of reports about the collective expulsions of the refugees who were staying in the camps, but also there were reports on the violence uh, within the camps. During the state of emergency, the camps were guarded both by the police and by the army, which is not according to the law and which is not something that happens in, in the ordinary situations. So um, at, at the moment, the situation is definitely, definitely not, not going very well. During the 2015 the, and 2016, the Serbia and its officials had this uh, presentation of Serbia as, as a welcoming country who treats refugees uh, with a lot of uh, humanity, unlike other countries. However, that has also dramatically changed, especially uh, with this COVID-19 situation. 
now the far right groups have um, a lot of influence here in Serbia. Uh, just during the state of emergency, one of the main uh, conspiracy theory was that the state of emergency was actually declared so that the government can uh, bring millions of refugees in Serbia and, and settle them in, in houses across the country. So now we have this Facebook group that in less than 10 days gathered more than uh, 300,000 members. We also had, uh, as soon as the state of emergency was revoked, we had two protests, anti-migrant protests in Belgrade. So the situation is definitely, definitely not going for the good and, and we definitely cannot hold this pretend title of, of a country that welcomes refugees anymore. So that would be some, some introduction from my side for now, but we'll probably talk about all of it later on. Great, thank you Milica. That was a great introduction to Serbia. Um, now we will move on to Katia for an introduction to the situation in Slovenia. Um, hello everybody, I'm Katia, a uh, member of an informal uh, community of uh, activists called Infokota. Um, I would like to talk about uh, what happened in Slovenia around the time of uh, this pandemic. It is uh, good to know that there was a change of government. Uh, the epidemic in the country of Slovenia was declared on the 12th of March 2020 and on the 13th of March 2020 a new uh, far-right coalition uh, started uh, with its mandate here in Slovenia, uh, which is a problem. Uh, two, two things here uh, are most problematic. Uh, one is that uh, there will be a systematic dismantling of uh, civil society attacks on the media, attacks on the whole NGO sector. Uh, and this uh, has already shown in the asylum home uh, where uh, funding was cut to organizations that uh, offer legal advice uh, and help uh, migrants with legal, legal difficulties here in Slovenia. Uh, the second uh, point, Besides this systematic dismantling of the civil society is the normalization of far-right paramilitary units in Slovenia that uh, patrol the southern border um, in search uh, of migrants. Uh, this is a relatively new thing here. It started last year. Uh, it was uh, then uh, attacked by the mainstream uh, political scene at the time and also by the media and so on. But under this new circumstance, now uh, these type of groups are going to, to have, uh, will be more brave, will be more, more motivated to, to do uh, their thing. So this is this. Um, even though during the pandemic the borders were closed, pushbacks were still happening. Uh, some pretty serious cases of uh, pushbacks. Uh, these pushbacks on the southern uh, Slovene border, which is the Schengen border, are actually kind of disguised into this informal um, readmission agreement between uh, Croatia and uh, Slovenia, where a person in uh, 48 hours, uh, when they enter a country, they can then be returned to, to Croatia. Uh, the only thing that, uh, and this was happening uh, regularly, we have reports that even though 
the borders were closed for everybody else, pushbacks were still happening. Um, so one uh, very serious case uh, happened around the 19th of April, where when a, a group of uh, young men managed to, to cross into Slovenia, they had uh, some accident and one of them had a very severely injured finger. Uh, the good thing in this bad situation is that they actually called the Slovene police and that then the, the, the man with the injured finger got some medical treatment. Uh, they amputated part of his finger and then uh, together with his uh, comrades, uh, he was uh, deported into uh, Croatia and then to Bosnia and Herzegovina. But I say uh, good is, uh, the good thing is that in this situation that they call the police. Uh, it is because in the, this um, winter, fall, winter 2019, 2020, in Slovenia, we had many, uh, we saw an increase of deaths of people on the move, on the move that we, of course, attribute to this very strict uh, border regime. And a very, um, a very serious case happened in November last year when, when a, a very young man, a young boy, died in the forest uh, near Ilirska Bistrica in Slovenia because uh, medical attention uh, did not uh, get to him in time. Uh, so, uh, yes, and there were other cases as well. We had a very tragic uh, car accident uh, also in the fall of 2019. And another young man who was uh, a participant in this car accident uh, died uh, now in April. He was 19 year old Syrian boy. Uh, he was for a, in a coma for many months and unfortunately he, he passed and he's now buried here in Ljubljana. Um, so, some statistic. From January till March 2020, from the 1,835 people detained by the Slovene police, 1,246 of them were readmitted by Croatian police. And I'm pretty sure all of them were returned to, to Bosnia. Um, uh -huh. There is also a suspension of asylum procedures until the 1st of July as a COVID, uh, COVID decree. This means no new asylum requests, no interviews, no decisions. Uh, this resulted in serious overcrow overcrowding of Ljubljana asylum, asylum camp. Uh, so they started uh, with these uh, asylum procedures because of uh, overcrowding, basically. Uh, another thing that uh, needs to be mentioned is that uh, we also had a, a silent uh, protest of 20 asylum seekers in uh, the asylum camp uh, at the end of uh, April. Uh, when they wanted to deport a man during the pandemic, they wanted to deport a man in a group with other people after he got two, uh, two uh, rejections, asylum rejections, to Croatia. We don't know why this, this didn't happen. Somewhere in between, uh, the Slovene police attacked him, returned him to the asylum home. He wanted to report the incident to the police, this, uh, the camp officials did not make this possible for him. So uh, he went on a hunger strike and uh, 20 uh, people living in asylum home supported him with this uh, silent protest. 
This man is currently detained. Uh, his case uh, was rejected on many levels, so his, his next uh, hope is the Constitutional Court, but we don't know uh, how this will go. Um, and yes, of course, and then in the context of this far right uh, agenda, political agenda that is now in Slovenia, which is uh, the party, the ruling Slovene Democratic Party is aligned with Orban Spidesh. Uh, so in this uh, context, there was also a call at the beginning of the pandemic to send the military uh, to the border and uh, to have this military with the police, um, police authority. This was rejected in the parliament, but this trend uh, this uh, discourse of safety of, of military of migrants as being some kind of a threat, military threat, uh, is unfortunately continuing here in Slovenia. So that would be for now. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Katia. Um, next we have Ziad. I'm not sure if he's, ah yeah, he's still with us, great. So Ziad's going to give us an update on the situation in Bosnia at the moment. Uh, Ziad, I think you have to unmute yourself. It's okay. Yeah, you hear perfect. Me? Yeah, we got nice, you. Nice, nice. Uh, situation in Bosnia, generally uh, all peoples are... Uh, are in uh, in actuality of migration in uh, in Balkans route uh, and uh, you know very well your uh, your country i talk about especially croatian slovenian bosnian and and serbian and uh, you know very well what happened there and uh, uh, first uh, b before i'm um, before i migrant i was i was activist in in uh, in Arab Springs revolution in in the first uh, country of Arab Springs in Tunisia, and I hear about uh, far right, far right, far right. This is the the real uh, situation of all the world. This is another story. Velika uh, Kladusha is the last point in uh, countries before you the europe your the last point before the europe union i'm uh, 400 meter from croatia now and uh, many 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 migrants come from uh, from sarajevo to velika kladusha and try to pass push back try to pass push back try to pass this story is from uh, 2015 i think 2016, from the last uh, day, who uh, they uh, closed the border from Hungary and uh, and Croatia, and Hungarian and Croatian take the the responsibility of all decision of Europe Union and especially Germany, who uh, uh, receive one million, especially Syrian and uh, many other countries from uh, a war in the in, in, in Middle East. And after they say finish, we receive the one million and we we close the border second time. Uh, and that's it, the responsibility stay in Croatia, uh, for, for Croatia especially, and because Hungary, there was uh, the, 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 the wall, uh, the metal wall, two metal wall one after one and uh, it's really uh, very very hard to pass so still Croatia Croatia politically have a uh, good uh, relationship with uh, with uh, with Bosnia and they don't want to uh, to install the the wall uh, the, the 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 metal wall so we can pass generally but the situation is uh, more hard 
for the with pol Croatian police. All of the now the people who still uh, have the news, all uh, actuality and news, uh, what uh, happened uh, in this area, know very well that the Croatian police is not uh, is not easy. I talk about Croatian police, uh, maybe Slovenian, uh, maybe Hungarian police too. I don't know the, uh, the what happened really in Hungary, but we heard about violence. Uh, what else? Slovenian police too apply the pushback out the law of Europe uh, Union and out the law of uh, of United Nations, but 99% no violence. You have one night. I was. She talked. Uh, the Miss talked about culpa and uh, and uh, her, her uh, organization and for culpa um, the river culpa i know him very well i know i know it very well is uh, and i have a story a joke <laughs> and for culpa i i try to pass with two migrants and uh, they have they haven't anybody there no police no uh, no uh, population and we pass at uh, eight evening like uh, this time and uh, they have a uh, uh, disappointment with two migrants with me and me in the middle of Kulpa and <laughs> one migrant tried to pass the to Slovenia and the last migrant still in Croatia and the police Croatian come to catch the guy who was in uh, in, uh, in 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 Croatia and the police Slovenian try to catch <laughs> try to catch the the guy who is in Slovenia and me I'm in the I'm in the middle and uh, the disappointment is not me so <laughs> the police Croatian and police uh, Slovenia they say you come you push back I say so I will get my my part of violence from Croatia tonight <laughs> or tomorrow with, with pushback I go to Slovenia Slovenia and I uh, I pass one night I have uh, dinner I talk about uh, my rights to uh, and this is the bad things in Slovenia you talk about your rights they uh, listen to you and you have right yes you have right to uh, to ask for asylum, and I, I, I told about uh, as a politic asylum is my my case, and I I was uh, out. Uh, I leave my country uh, for a big problem with uh, the far right Islamist party, and uh, is another <laughs> another things of far right of uh, in Europe. So I say okay, and tomorrow go in your uh, van and back to Croatia so uh, and that's it uh, push back from from Europe Union they haven't any right to uh, to to uh, to back me so that's it Croatians say please I work more than 10 hours so be quiet don't talk about your right you don't have any right so you still silent is is better in Croatia uh many many times uh, I, I i tried 10 times to to cross uh croatia 10 times push back i'm always yet in uh, in north bosnia but uh, uh many many times uh, they haven't any violence huh? they uh, broke uh, my they broke my uh, my phone and I uh, many times, but uh, one time I uh, I fix it. Is not real broken. Is uh, they they they. I think they uh, they have the metal things. They make the they they, they broke the camera for and they don't they didn't broke the camera of uh, of selfie the 
the face camera. So it's not really categoric, the violence, you understand? I tried next time, last time, before uh, the last time. In January, just after I told my group to stay two days after, just after the, the vote in Croatia of uh, Grabar, uh, Mrs. Grabar, uh, uh, I don't know the name, and uh, the, yes, that's it, Kitarovic, and, uh, and um, my party, Socialist Democrat Party, Mr. Milanovic. So I say is maybe good uh, news. The SPD of Croatia still in uh, in power. So socialism for all, no for <laughs> no for migrant, but it's okay. <laughs> So is uh, that's it. Push back to uh, Velika Kladusha. Velika Kladusha is another population. It's the same. All of them are uh, are, are 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 Serbian, Serbian people and Bosnian people and and Croatian. Just three religion or generally, but all same same. It's like Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and South Spain and South Italy all the same but difference of uh, they have difference because three country and three uh, i have another part of analyze because i'm not a real migrant just that's it and i'm a fake migrant <laughs> maybe i'm a journalist <laughs> maybe i'm i'm a spy in in this area but uh, so uh, it's the same people is just uh, three uh, country every country have them decision and maybe i can understand croatia she's new in europe union she's not uh, 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 like slovenia she's not a big country who have the europe commission in brussels commission brussels who give the decision is between two hands generally in, in, we stay in uh, in migration uh, uh, decision in between two hands, uh, Germany and France generally, and Italy and Spain. They they talk about uh, 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 they talk about the rush in. Uh, they try to make rush for some politic uh, point because they are in the in the in the in the door they are the door of europe greece they can't mercantize about migration so this the, the, is the decision of europe union and uh, germany uh, so i can generally i can understand croatia and slovenia so i can't understand because my right is to ask migration, uh, to ask uh, the asylum, but I can understand why they push back, why they refuse. They, because, but the problem, uh, migrant, he can't understand, uh, you know. So you, he go to Croatia, hungry, no uh, clothes, no anything just hope and he go first time he stay eight nine night days in forest of croatia and they know very well them them country is all forest and i know that country is very very beautiful and uh, many uh, too much uh, water and uh, too much, uh, and we, we, we come from, and especially the South Algeria and South Morocco, and Morocco generally, uh, they come from Sahara, and the uh, migrant, uh, they, they cross uh, Croatia, and they cross uh, some part of Hungary, and they cross Slovenia, and they say, wow, if we have this water in our land, we stay, we stay, we, we don't come here. So it's, is this is the justice of uh, of who create this world is that uh, and uh, that's why we ask we ask europe to receive some of us 
in Europe and we receive some of European in our country. Our country is still always open. So this is the 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 uh, the, the behavior and this is the comportment of, of Mediterranean Sea. We are always open. So you go to like tourists in our uh, in our country and you know this. Uh, so push back back to slow to Velika Kladusha. I talk about myself. Velika Kladusha is population still generally very good with migrants. They uh, talk about uh, the uh, time of, uh, I don't know, I haven't uh, many, uh, maybe I go outside because the light, because uh, I haven't light. <laughs> uh, one second, please. Yes, it's still uh, some, it's not the sun, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, so this is Velika uh, Kladusha. Uh, uh, generally, the population are uh, very good with uh, with uh, migrants. Generally, many migrants are not good in in in, in Bosnia. So uh, here, the to to say the truth, here the the, the situation is not. Uh, is, is, is here the, the, the migrant is not good because he think himself is psycho like that is, is he think he's himself he, he's poor and he is uh, and he is hungry so he have all right to do anything so no you haven't the right my friend you can you can say please and you, they can give you food and especially here in the, in in, uh, in Bosnia they make some problem so police is police like in all the world is not uh, <laughs> is, is, is the same same shit and <laughs> and uh, that's it thank you ziad okay have... okay yes no i did i don't understand uh, I don't. I didn't hear. unmute myself. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. I have some people ah, okay. asking in the YouTube uh, comments if there yes. is a way they can follow you or your work on social media. I don't know if you have some way that people can follow you or follow me in social media. They are asking if they can follow your work. Maybe see more about what you do. I didn't understand. Like, if you have some kind of social media where. You you are explaining uh, Facebook. The you under, you talk about uh, Facebook or? Yeah, if you want to give, this is fine. Yes, uh, is uh, Z or Twitter if you have? No, no, I haven't Twitter. Okay. I I let the, uh, the Twitter for uh, for uh, Donald Trump. So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's not my it's not my business. But uh, but uh, Facebook, yeah, and uh, if you Tunisian, tell them, uh, they yeah. will see where they can find. Yes, you. is is okay. I, I'm uh, I think I'm uh, friend Facebook with Milena. Yes. So okay. Yeah. Milena and, uh, will post in the comments. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I will. Uh, how can I share with them uh, the Facebook? I don't know. Uh, Milena will put in the YouTube comments. So this is we will Very deal nice. with this. Good. Thank Good. you, nice. Ziad. Good. All right. Good. So if you stick around, yeah. there will be some more questions for you later. Yeah. Okay. So okay. now okay. let's move on to Simon. So Simon, if you could give us a little update on the situation in Greece. And also maybe more generally the COVID report as you are the field coordinator for BBM. So that's more your realm. Yeah, great. Um, hello everyone. My name is Simon Campbell. And as Hope said, I'm working with the, with the field volunteers. So the people taking reports as part of the border violence monitoring network. And um, we recently came out with a report specifically around COVID and it, how uh, public health policy has interrelated with, with borders and 
I think touching on what the rest of the, the speakers have, have brought up, we really saw that uh, in many senses, a lot hasn't changed during the COVID period. Pushbacks are still happening. And maybe the, I think the impacts of the, of the pandemic has really, it's just sharpened the inequality that people are facing both at borders and also in interiors, in camps, uh, in transit hubs. But the, the kind of arc of police violation that's occurring when people are trying to cross between uh, state territories in the Western Balkans in Greece uh, remains incredibly violent. Um, Milena already cited the fact that a, a kind of projected 25,000 people were pushed back from Croatia last year. We only have a partial data set on this, this uh, year or the, the months in 2020, but it seems like it's continuing even with a fair amount of people locked inside camps uh, for, a, for a good two months, uh, especially in Serbia and Bosnia. Um, and I mean, this is borne out in the, the physical violence that we're seeing conferred onto the bodies of, of people on the move. You had the, the high profile case um, of people in Poljana who got pushed back and were filmed, which was shared on Facebook. And two uh, cases of chain pushbacks recently from Slovenia showing uh, both one a minor uh, with severe injuries to the ear and also the case that Katia mentioned of the, of the injured finger. So there's still this physical evidence that if you enter the border areas um, in, in the Western Balkans, you will meet people on a regular basis who are suffering these pushbacks. But I suppose we also saw a really dark turn or the use of this uh, state of emergency, the, the period of um, restrictions to, for states to launch uh, even more repressive uh, actions against people on the move, or maybe to complete these trajectories that were already occurring, but with the, the opportunity of global attention turned the other way, and also restrictions in terms of movement for monitors, people, the general public, um, and I suppose critical eyes on what was going on. We saw incidents like the spray, t spray painting of uh, people as they crossed the Croatian border. I think many will have seen that, but for those that don't know, um, this incident occurred in the last month and involved Croatian police officers uh, spraying orange paint on the crown of people's heads while they were pushing them back, uh, which is, I suppose, a really stark and a horrific act, but also marries up with the existing knowledge we have of pushbacks, which we know involve uh, specific targeted violence, elements of torture. We've seen, obviously, beatings with, with sticks and batons, but we also know that tasers are used against people um also that they've used tree branches uh, multiple different improvised weapons uh and this this development of the spray painting is somehow horrific in a sense but matches up with with what's been going on since um early 2018 when transit from from bosnia uh began to spike and the and the pushbacks um fell in place immediately um so that case uh i guess hit the, hit the headlines but it's uh maybe it touches on this point that these, these actions were already taking place. Um, interestingly, this pushback or the, the pushback groups that were affected by this were targeted by police officers who were in the same area that Milena was referencing, um, where there were confirmed cases of coronavirus within police forces who were stationed in a, in a mass barracks, being hosted in a hotel in the border area. Um, and the Ministry of Interior in Croatia continued to place these officers there while they were a health risk to people, um, allowing them to carry out these violent acts. Um, so you see also the, the internal state authorities emboldened in, in, their, in their task of carrying out violent pushbacks. Uh, notably also the Ministry of Interior were, were in charge of the pub public health aspect. So you see the merging um, of responses to the, to the virus and migration policy and how those interlock and how those have become increasingly more violent for people on the move. Uh, that's uh, emerged in different ways in, in countries along the Western Balkans. In Serbia, you saw a leading towards the, the garrisoning, and garrisoning of camps uh, and use of the military, um, which I, th I suppose is not a new thing in, in the Western Balkans. We've seen also the, the recent case of Slovenia trying to push power for the army. But we know in the past, uh, military have been involved in pushbacks, but the, the fact of using them to lock down camps is a, another aspect where we've seen um, the corona period as a chance to um, carry out further rights violations, um, further suspension of people's movement and liberties. 
Uh, I think for for me now in in, in Thessaloniki, maybe I can speak uh, best about the the pushbacks that have been occurring here because it's what I've been observing or speaking to people. But we we realise that pushbacks have been occurring broadly across the route. Um, in the COVID period, maybe the biggest development uh, has been the expansion of pushbacks into camps, um, and some fairly high profile cases occurred. Uh, from the Thessaloniki area, but also in, in other areas in Greece, where police officers have been during the COVID lockdown uh, and since uh, coming into camps or the, the informal settlements on the edge of official refugee camps, picking people up and delivering them, driving them to the border with Turkey and pushing them back there. Uh, and this represents, I think, a really stark change. Um, in terms of the policing of the border, where usually pushbacks occur in this area close to the Evros River or in the interior as people are making foot journeys or, or crossing towards these, these larger cities like Thessaloniki. Um, but the fact that uh, the police have been able to enter camps halfway across the mainland uh, and remove people, often with the promise of issuing them a short term regularization document. Uh, I think just goes to show the, the yeah, as I said, the, the how emboldened they feel um, and how during the, the lockdown measures, state authorities have been able to complete a set of tasks that were already, I suppose, in the pipeline. We saw that with the, the violence used against people at the border crossing in Castines in early March when large people, large groups of people arrived um, at the border from Turkey. Uh, but we saw how the suspension of asylum rights uh, during this standoff with Turkey quickly merged into the complete suspension of asylum rights during COVID uh, and how these two states of emergency uh, crossed over. Since then, many, many people have been pushed back who were in effect, an effective limbo. They had no access to asylum in Greece. They also didn't have access to this temporary regularization document that's usually referred to as Khartia. Uh, and they were kicked back into Turkey using with, with extreme violence. We have one case of a guy who was actually even in a car accident uh, and he was patched up in hospital after a severe leg break. And as soon as he was able to be moved, the police entered the hospital uh, and delivered him to the border point where, again, in successive testimonies, we've recorded over 200 people in the last six weeks or so. Um, these, these people were subject to violence from Greek military officials who were using improvised detention spaces in the border area and kicking them back to Turkey. So I think that's uh, in Greece one of the major changes, but we also saw, aside from pushbacks, a whole raft of um, policies directed against uh, transit communities, which speak to this use of the state of emergency um, to, to clamp down further. So we saw that in the detention spaces in Paranesti, uh, riot cops being deployed into the camp uh, to beat people up who are on hunger strike. That has parallels, I suppose, to what went on in Krynyaka and in other camps in Serbia, where we saw special forces entering the camps. And I think that's an important point to note that within COVID, maybe some of the actors that already had a strong hand within pushbacks or police brutality gained, gained more power. Um, we can speak for sure of special forces in, in several countries. We can speak of the military. We can also speak of Frontex as well. Uh, at the Greek border during the March period, there was a rapid deployment uh, of, of officers, which was adding an extra 100 personnel. Um, but right in the middle of COVID, during the early April period, uh, this uh, temporary deployment was extended. So we saw um, this state of exception prolonging, enduring, and we know now that the pushbacks from Diavata, which we first observed as a COVID impact, uh, have continued even after the restrictions have loosened in Greece. Uh, and that's maybe one of the worrying things that I would, I would share, I suppose, about, about COVID is that the, a lot of the, the policy or the implement, Ill, illegal implementation that's come into place now, uh, we see maybe being entrenched uh, and definitely from an EU level with the, with the backing that Frontex has seen, both financially and, and in terms of personnel, but also the guidelines issued by the Commission which allowed for states to prevent entry to people who were seen as a viral risk. And, and this was, I think, in a guarded sense, painting transit groups and people on the move as, as, a, as a public health threat, which goes along this kind of securitarian response to the pandemic, um, which neglects the real need for frontline healthcare workers, reinvestment in, uh, in hospitals, 
um, care for the elderly and vulnerable communities and actually targets those at the bottom of structural hierarchies of race and, and norm, norms of, of documentation. Uh, so I think that this is perhaps the most concerning, the rise of these actors. We also saw with fascist attacks, both on the islands, also in a Brenovac camp, there was a, a man who, who drove his vehicle into the camp to try and attack refugees. And Milica spoke of, of these far right um, demonstrations that have occurred in Serbia. So across the route, there's you know been been this uh, space eked out for for far right and fascist groups, which is again concerning and overlaps with the neoconservative approach that governments are um, capitalising on during the COVID period. Um, and certainly in, in terms of chain pushbacks and, and the way these are happening, an interesting development has also been the, the pushbacks from camps in, in Serbia, which again is a, a, a relatively new development, although we also saw that at the end of the closure of the humanitarian corridor. So I think there's some parallels as well in, in the way that states of emergency uh, have, have emerged uh, in terms of the sealing of borders, but also Corona. We think, you know, five years later, pushbacks from camps are occurring when they also were initiated from places like Subotica uh, at the period when the Hungarian border closed. In the, in the case of the people we spoke to here in Greece who were pushed back from, uh, from Tutin camp in Serbia, uh, they, they had special force officers entering the camp, promising them they would take them to a new facility um, to allow them to better isolate and that the reason was for virus protection. They found themselves then in uh, the Macedonian border uh, being kicked out at gunpoint, um, which we hear is a common means of removing people from, from countries across the Balkan route, but again is entirely illegal. It's just remarkable that this has happened from an institutional uh, accommodation site, which you would assume to be a safe refuge, but during Corona has, has become anything but that. Um, so I think this, this, these uh, incidents, both in Greece and, and Serbia, uh, speak to like a rising uh, power for states to carry out illegal collective expulsions uh, and and this tactical support from from the European Union or uh, their lack of condemnation for these acts is is quite worrying. Uh, I think maybe we'll touch on the questions in terms of the situation in camps in Bosnia and other places as well because I think there's there's something to be said for the internal repression and the the actors such as security uh, and in, and police violence which is happening within transit states. We've we've seen recent incidents and spikes in violence there, one man being killed in a camp in Sarajevo and, and another dying, um, avoided, an avoidable death in Miral camp, and most recently videos of people being beaten inside those camps. So I think it's also worth noting that not just at the borders, but in the interiors, people are suffering uh, policies which are um, being perpetrated by, by the states and the domestic policy, but also supported by the, the EU funded camp systems where, where they're accommodated, which I think is a key thing to note there. Um, and I think I've overspoken a bit, so I'll, I'll leave, it to, leave it at that and maybe we can jump into questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'm going to, I would just explain a bit again about how the questions will work. I did at the beginning, but maybe not everybody was here. So I'm going to ask some more general questions to prompt discussion. You guys can kind of jump in as you wish. Um, and then we will take questions from the comments on the live stream. So if you want to start commenting now what your questions are, if you want to direct them to one particular person or one particular region, you, you can put that in the brackets or if it's just for everybody, you can let us know as well. Um, so the first question I'm just going to start with to prompt everybody off is quite a simple one, but <laughs> let's see how we get on. So um, how do you guys think the nature of pushbacks has changed over these crisis, over the COVID-19 crisis? And what similarities and differences, key ones, have you observed in, in most recent months? Anyone want to jump in? Maybe I can respond at least from the, the cases in short that we've been observing from, from Serbia and Macedonia. That there's been an interesting turn in terms of uh, these disaggregated chain pushbacks. Often we're seeing very organized um, and institutionally enacted pushbacks from Slovenia through Croatia to Bosnia, which make use or misuse of the readmissions agreement. Um, but one of the quirks or change during, changes during COVID has been 
this use of kind of ad hoc pushbacks through Macedonia, where people are being um, pushed back violently by police, but with no collaboration between the Serbian and, and Macedonian authorities. And then only later, maybe a week or so later, being picked up in the interior and, and pushed back into Greece. So some kind of domino effect is occurring there. And one of the people we spoke to as well had been previously pushed back uh, from Romania into Serbia. So um, this kind of chain or valves that are occurring in terms of movement between countries somehow to, seem to have spiked. I think those, um, those mechanisms were already at play, but it seems to have spiked during the COVID period where police could move people en masse with buses uh, without, the, without journalists or people monitoring what was going on and there was a lack of oversight. And sp specifically in the, in the Croatian case, I think the, the spray painting is, is one stark case, although we only saw maybe three incidents or three transit groups faced by that. Um, but it's, it's notable because it seems like, uh, well, it's, it's such an animal, uh, treating someone like an animal, it's, it's really inhumane and degrading. Um, but perhaps it does have, it shares continuity with, with other torturous practices that we've seen in reports. I mean, in, in the report we made around um, pushbacks from Croatia in 2019, over 80% of the cases matched um, the legal uh, understanding or terminology for breaches of uh, law on, on degrading, inhumane, uh, torturous treatment. Uh, so th those things were, I guess, were already occurring. But we, I think that's one of the major changes also was, was this phenomena of the spray painting. I mean, as far as Slovenia is concerned, um, I don't think much has changed. P pushbacks... Uh, are going on in the same way that they were before, which in itself is bizarre because the borders were closed for everything else, absolutely everything else except for this um, illegal uh, practice of, uh, of denying people the right to claim asylum in Slovenia. Okay, I'll move on to the next question if no one has anything else to add. So, um, how would you say people on the move have experienced COVID-19 versus the general population? What have the key differences been? How have the vulnerabilities been compounded? I would say, uh, if I may, uh, Concerning trend, especially what we've seen in Bosnia, but I'm sure that Ziad can say more about this, having a first-hand experience uh, is that uh, all the sanitary measures and all of the anti-pandemic measures that were applied uh, to the citizens of the states that we are talking about somehow uh, skipped population of the people on the move. Ironically, people of the, on the move were the only ones moving through Croatia at one point, but at the same time, they were the only ones who didn't have real access to protective equipment or even basic hygiene in the countries, uh, in the more transit countries, such as Bosnia, for example. So when we are talking about uh, almost zero cases of, of COVID, among the migrant population, I'm wondering like how many have actually been tested and if the situation might even be different. I cer certainly hope that, that there is no uh, new outbreak in that sense. But uh, if we did, if you ask us if we did the right thing or if we did what would be like a minimum humane treatment in the circumstances of pandemic, I'm afraid that we miserably failed these people again. Ziad, maybe you can say more, like how, how the things have changed for you during the pandemic, not only for you, but also for people, people in this area. Uh, two months of, uh, of, uh, of COVID-19 uh, coronavirus is, uh, is I, I, lo I lost, uh, I, 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 I lost and I, I, I was, uh, uh preoccupied by uh, finding food 
not uh, to to protect myself by coronavirus because uh, the people who give us food and who give us some money to 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 uh, to help us is is, uh, is uh, they they talk about pomoc is 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 helping is uh, they didn't give us between two months because coronavirus you understand and generally is 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 not the and we and big uh, info uh, big news uh, we had all coronavirus 90% of migrants in bosnia in velika kladesha had coronavirus but we have we are in good uh, health we can uh, walk and 13 uh, 30 and 40 kilometers by day mountains of uh, of croatia and slovenia we are uh, young and uh, uh, we have good health so coronavirus stay 2 3 days i had uh, uh, fever and i had some uh, between mars and april Two days, last uh, in last days of Mars and the first days of April, I think, I had a fever and I had a headache and I had uh, some weakness in muscles. So and and all my friends are like me. So this is ninety percent. I'm not a doctor, but this is ninety percent coronavirus. Uh, I don't make up things is my is my that's why they say they told they told me so you leave tunisia or we kill you this is the party islamist party they say because i didn't i don't make up things so 90 percent of of migrants had coronavirus it's just we are in good health and in last uh, april doctors <laughs> after two months doctors come this is the the question after two months of coronavirus did the doctor come and he tests some cases and he say coronavirus pass from here and go <laughs> and so all of them had the coronavirus you understand all of us thank you Ziad. Me, yeah um so the next question I will ask, um, I don't think we really touched on this so much uh, so far, so I'm, maybe it'll be interesting to get a response from all of you, is um, how you see the role of the EU in what's been happening over this period. Because I know we spoke in the report um, about the joint action plan that the EU released for human rights, but what has happened with that? Has it come into the fore? Or how do you think the EU has played a role during the pandemic? I can respond a little bit in short and maybe someone wants to, to add in. I, mean, I think I already touched a little bit on, I, I think the concerning developments around Frontex um, and also the guidelines uh, released that um, effectively allowed for the further furthering of asylum rights suspension, something that we've already seen for a long time, um, but that was even more heightened during the COVID period. Um, we see that as Milena said, a large number of people are um, requesting asylum or making this expression of a content when ent uh, entering Croatia, also in other countries, um, but the closure of it um, was somehow beckoned or hearkened in by this decision by the EU. Uh, in terms of uh, fundamental rights or human rights um, and humane conditions, we've seen very little action. Uh, a lot of the attention has been on the Greek islands uh, and campaigns like leave no one behind. Uh, but, you know, you, you also saw the, the conditions inside the EU funded camps in, in Bosnia, for instance, being incredibly poor. The sanitation there is already not up to scratch. It's, it's already not fit for purpose. Uh, but to lock people inside those spaces uh, without ad adequate access to food, um, definitely no access to, to proper self-isolation and a lack of access to, to institutional health care. Um, is, is a key key failing um, and again the 
the fact that these were EU funded camps where people have been forcibly removed from squat communities into, um, we see that there is no attention to, to the rights of those people. Um, there's been some very, very violent incidents uh, carried out in the Unisana canton, um, squat, squat clearances carried out by Bosnian authorities. Um, and the fact that IOM run uh, accommodation centers are receiving people and somehow uh, co cooperating in that exchange is extremely worrying. And that's EU money that's being funneled into those um, those camps, which are not sufficient to, to meet the requirements or the capacities needed. One of the persons, people who died recently, died because they had to climb over the fence into Miral camp, close to Velika Kladusha, because there wasn't enough capacity inside and they weren't able to register themselves uh, in this real time of need with the coronavirus occurring. Um, so I think the, this is just one of just one of the examples where you see um, the EU's policy in, in the wider Western Balkans to be incredibly weak, um, in even, even in terms of the, the supposed humanitarian work that it's doing. Uh, in terms of backing up borders, the, the Commission guidelines have just allowed member states to fall back in, in terms of uh, shutting down all borders. Uh, and it's incredible how re reflexive they can be in that. Uh, and, and how inflexible they can be in terms of asylum policy um, and border regimes, which have persisted in being incredibly cruel um, and, you know, not, not sticking to, to the rule of law. It should be noted also that uh, the EU institutions and the EU as a whole have a very long legacy of uh, immense failures in uh, this region especially dating to the war in the 90s. So it is also understandable, especially for Bosnian people who were really left behind and betrayed by uh, many of the EU institutions in the 90s to be very frustrated about the role of EU agencies in Bosnia now. And these are the same agencies that were mishandling uh, the cases of, of real torture during the 90s as well. And they, did, they failed to respond adequately to the suffering of these people. Uh, so at the same time, you see uh, this almost, I would say, deliberate neglect of uh, people in the countries that are now burdened with uh, dealing with the uh, problems of the EU as uh, those who are aspiring to enter this uh, flawed union, I must say, in many ways. At the same time, you have member states that are very obviously violating basics of human rights uh, systematically for years and it is really really hard to make an argument for EU in that sense that somebody is not aware of what is happening. This is not the issue of Croatia or Hungary or Greece. This is the EU-wide policy what is happening and I'm talking about pushbacks now but the entire situation with COVID, which was, by the way, handled by the same authorities that are responsible for pushbacks in many of the countries, including Croatia, is just uh, the recent manifestation of failures to provide, even for their own citizens, let alone people who are coming here in hopes for international protection. So I think something really needs to change in Brussels. Uh, in the centers of power, such as Germany and France, in order to see real change in the countries on the outskirts of the EU or in the member states that are now put in this very awkward position of defending the EU soil, such as Croatia and Hungary. For uh, Croatia, uh, this uh, political trade was rather uh, obvious and uh, some of uh, our politicians even verbalized it. Pushbacks are something we need to do in order to enter Schengen area. And then you had European Commission giving us technical green lights to enter Schengen area under very doubtful circumstances, I must say. Of course, as a Croatian citizen, I want my country to enter Schengen area, but not at the cost of human lives. And this is what is happening now. Then you have countries that are now hoping to get the chance to enter the Union, such as Serbia, Bosnia, Macedonia. And here again, you have this very fertile grounds for uh, political trade, because okay, if you, you know, deal with these several thousands of people that we don't want to accept, maybe, you know, you might get the ch chance in the next round 
to apply for membership. So I would say that the uh, Balkans as a whole, as a region, experienced uh, this sort of uh, ignorant treatment by the Western European countries for a long time. And I'm quite surprised, to be honest, how much we are still willing to obey the rules and requirements from the EU, even when it comes to doing their dirty job again. But uh, this is why, for example, I'm very interested in advocacy and in addressing things where I think it really matters. Because unfortunately, as Ziad said, uh, Croatia is not a very big country and it's rather new in the EU. And there are many processes that we still have to go through in order to be openly fascist or like openly whatever we want to be. Until then, we really have to play by the EU rules. So my hopes are that we can really address some of these issues in the European Parliament, in the European Commission, to try to make some real change. But unfortunately, having in mind uh, the change in the common European asylum system that is announced, I'm afraid that we are facing even more externalization, even more militarization of our borders. And then it will just boil down to the solidarity of regular people again. May I just add one thing? Um, since Serbia is still not a member of the European Union, but we are the candidate and the question of asylum and migration is part of the chapter 24, which was one of the first chapter that was open and it will definitely be one of the last ones to be closed. European Union has a big influence here. Uh, our government is doing anything it, it says to do in these um, accessions um, procedures. Over the past three or four years, the European Union has invested a lot of money in different projects across Serbia. Four years ago, we had only five asylum camps, and today we have 19. Uh, asylum Office, as the um, authority within the Ministry of Interior, which is in charge for the asylum procedure, also got a lot of funds to uh, professionalize its staff, also to hire new staff. However, the asylum procedure at the moment is completely not functional. A very small number of people have actually access to asylum procedure. During the 2019, less than 2% of people who are in Serbia managed to apply for asylum. In 2018, we adopted the new law on asylum, which should be in line with EU directives. And it is, for the most part, except with the part where people can actually get registered and enter and start the asylum procedure. These rules are quite strict, so people can very easily slip off the procedure and be illegally in Serbia. We also adopted a new law on the foreigners, which should be in align with EU directives, but it's not. Uh, it completely deprives people who are residing illegally in Serbia of any rights. We have the new uh, procedure for deportation. At the moment, Serbia is not doing deportations in practice, only because there is a lack of funds for such things. But we are afraid that Serbia might get the funds for such actions. We are quite worried about the new agreement that was announced with the Austria, where Austria will have the possibility to deport rejected asylum seekers back to Serbia, especially since Serbia is also planning, according to the official uh, government's plans, it's planning to sign readmission agreements with Afghanistan, with Iraq, with Algeria, Morocco, so all the countries where most refugees come from. And we are afraid that Serbia might very easily become um, a platform countries where uh, countries from the European Union will be able to deport people here and from Serbia they will be able to get deported back to the countries of origin. These people who are residing illegally and that is 98% of people, even those who are in the camps, now officially we divide camps into asylum camps and transit camps, but all of these camps more than 90% of people are not in the, in the asylum procedure and they don't have any kind of rights. So we, we will see how, how the situation will develop, but just to answer the question that the European Union can have quite a big influence here.
Great, thank you. Um, I Because we started a bit late due to technical difficulties, is everyone okay? We continue going for another 20, 30 minutes, yeah? Okay, perfect. Um, I have one more question and then there's a load of great questions in the comments, so we'll move over there next. Um, my last question is, how have transit groups living in squats and informal accommodations been affected and how have transit groups or more permanent migrant uh, refugees or migrants living in camps been affected and how have the two been different? Um, I personally would be interested in answering this question from Serbia and Bosnia, but of course, everybody who wants to can jump in. Um, specifically, Bosnia would be interested to hear a bit more about the Lipa camp. Ziad, do you want to take us through what's been happening with um, people living in informal accommodations and people in the camp or what's been happening with the Lipa camp in Bosnia? Yes, uh, Lipa camp first is uh, near Bihać, after Bihać 20 kilometers. And uh, near uh, 20 kilometers too from the border with uh, Croatia, uh, Lipa camp is because the municipality of Bihać decide to get out all migrants from Bihać center. This is because in Bosnia, you know, uh, they have uh, the, 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 the Sarajevo uh, power, the Sarajevo decision, and after the federation of every region and after the federation of municipality, municipality of Velika Kladusha, no, no, is, is deportation, is, is, uh, is moving uh, by force. Lipa camp is moving by force. They take you police, and they get you to Lipa camp uh, by force. Don't stay in Bihać because Bihać is uh, some city of, uh, so they say it's tourist, touristic, I, I, I don't know, but uh, uh, maybe migrant, he, uh, he, uh, he is not good for, for decor or for tourists, <laughs> but uh, that's it. Uh, Milena, she, talk about politic of, of European Union 90% I'm okay with what she uh, what she talked about uh, <laughs> uh, European Union Brussels have a decision and Croatia have the execution European Union have decision and Italia have execution that's it so and I told you I'm not a real migrant. I'm a politician. I understand very well the the, the, the behavior of police Croatia and uh, is, is, is big shame for all Europeans. It's not for only Croatian on, and, and Croatia uh, state to, to beat someone like this. It's not, uh, it's not it's, uh, many, many of them go straightly to hospital. And the hospital of Bosnia they don't accept them they say go camp so this is uh, our uh, our uh, uh, daily like this huh? every I, I see every every migrant like that uh, decision is for uh, is for uh, brussels brussels open border brussels open door and brussels close and if you have 10 group for 10 person, every group, 100 every day, and 10 group, they enter, the, the police become uh, deboarded and uh, and uh, he have to, 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 to broke some bones to let you stay in uh, Velika Kladusha more weak than you back tomorrow because Migrant, he have uh, big, uh, 
big hope and big. Uh, they can't. They can't. They can't uh, broke the hope. We, they, they can't broke the idea. They can't broke. It's, it's, you understand? Is uh, me? I ha I have a project to my country after the revolution. They can't broke my idea. I go to Europe and I finish my study. I uh, I found my family and I back to Tunisia to uh, is. Uh, they can't the idea the idea and the hope they can't broke just and europe union and uh brussels they know very well they know very well the f the only uh the only uh, solution for migration to to get down the number because always migration but they get to, to we, we talk about a uh, 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 normal number because in Serbia too they are deboarded by by migrant. You, 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 I, uh, I, uh, we heard uh, the miss from uh, Milica uh, from uh, Serbia. She talked about uh, crazy numbers they enter to 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 Serbia and camps. Uh, now the uh, I don't know 19 camps in 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 Serbia and and it's only uh, a country of transit so it's crazy. The only solution is in Africa and in 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 uh, uh, Middle East. The solution there is not in Europe. You understand. European people uh, found uh, them solution before 200 years. <laughs> it's not now. Now is uh, us. And I talk about French Revolution. Thank you, Ziad. Great. Um, Milica, do you want to tell us more, maybe from the um, Serbian perspective? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, as I mentioned, so all the illegal squats in Serbia, uh, there, is, there was a big uh, squat at the border with Croatia, uh, close to the city of Šid, and there were two big squats close to the city of Subotica at the northern border with Hungary. Uh, also, there was a lot of smaller uh, squats across Belgrade. Uh, when the, the COVID crisis started, also all of the hostels were closed. So all the refugees, as we're seeing in Belgrade hostels, had to go out. And the police went to all of these squads and uh, forced all the people to go to the camps. People were distributed to different camps without some specific uh, rule who goes where. They even separated uh, the groups of, of friends or family that traveled together and shipped them to different camps. Some of them ended up in detention center also here in Belgrade. Uh, so there, there was a very, very small number of people who managed to stay outside of the camps and in squads, but this is a very, very small number of people. So it's basically insignificant. When it comes to the situation in camp, uh, all camps were overcrowded. There was a lot of reports of violence, uh, the presence of the police, the presence of the army, but also there was no protective measures in the term of transmission of the virus. So there was not enough, um, there was none of the face masks, gloves, stuff like that, that was, that we all had to use. Um, also, generally, the hygiene in the camps is not, uh, is not satisfactory. For example, in the camp Krnjeta, which is on the outskirts of Belgrade, which is one of the, the biggest camps in Serbia, uh, in one barrack that has 15 rooms, and each room has three or four people there on the normal terms, it has only one bathroom with three showers. So even in the normal terms, this is not enough for this, this number of people. And especially in, in the time of the virus where we all had to um, be extra careful about the hygiene. So the situation was definitely, definitely not good. Generally, the almost all camps, they have a doctor who comes once a week or two times a week for a general uh, check up, it's a general practitioner. Uh, during the state of emergency, they were also not allowed to go to the camps. So 
the refugees could not visit the doctor even for some other uh, things unrelated to, to the virus. Also, none of the NGOs were allowed to enter. This is especially worrying because in some camps, like Obrenovac, which is also here in Belgrade, the NGOs and international organizations are providing food. So there was also a lack of food in some camps. So the situation was generally not great. Thanks for that, Melitza. Um, I'm going to go on to the uh, questions in the comments. Uh, first of all, Ziad, are you still with us? Don't know if your screen has paused. Okay, we'll wait and see if he comes back because I have... Ah, you're back. Can you hear me, Ziad? Yeah? Okay, you're a bit of a star with the people watching. <laughs> they have some questions just specifically for you. So two questions specifically for you from the watchers are, what's next for you? And how do you charge your phone? <laughs> I had <laughs> this question with uh, my friend, uh, journalist, is from uh, Slovenia. His name is uh, Micha. Is uh, crazy things and uh, two months, <laughs> two two months. Uh, the mosques are closed, so I charge my charge my phone. I was charging my phone in mosques, and uh, I spent two months charging my phone in uh, one veranda. They have uh, electricity outside, and I charge my phone. The neighbors are good. He let my phone charging and he let my power bank charging. Uh, no coffee. I was charging my phone in coffee, special migrant coffee, because uh, we can't enter and stay with uh, people here in uh, all many coffee. Just we have two coffee. We stay uh, migrants and we talk about uh, news of uh, Croatia and Slovenia and uh, Trieste in the, the first uh, city in Italia and uh, pushbacks and uh, uh, organization of No Names Kitchen is a wonderful organization who uh, help us and make a big job, real, really, really big job. And I make uh, big friendship, uh, friendlyship with them and uh, all, all of them are uh, my friends now. Thanks God I talk English because, <laughs> and I talk French too, many uh, friends people and from France and English. So it's a um, good step uh, to enter in Europe. Uh, and they invite me from all Europe, from Zagreb to London, I'm invited. Uh, this is this is Europe. We really is uh, 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 is uh, this is really uh, the, the 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 European people is not. Uh, uh, and I have many many friends too in in Athena and uh, Crete Island. Crete Island is uh, two 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 hundred kilometers from Tunisia. So uh, I'm I go to Istanbul and I back to. 150 from Tunisia. Crete Island is is near Libya and in the, in the middle of Mediterranean Sea. So it's and I have friends there and I they say stay stay and I want I want to go to Europe to finish my study so I can stay in in little Iceland. So <laughs> and I haven't rights any right in uh, in in Athena to to stay. Uh, charging uh, mobile is uh, all 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 things is by mobile. You go to Croatia, you have uh, Google Maps, and especially some uh, 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 application uh, names uh, Maps Me is uh, the application who uh, w uh, function without internet because you haven't uh, Wi-Fi in. In Croatia forest, so you can, uh, <laughs> if the if socialist party uh, <laughs> can make for us <laughs> Wi-Fi in forest, but I have I, I I have I I, uh, I cross uh, big beers in 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 in, uh, in Croatia in uh, in the middle night I cross. Uh, 
the root is not in uh, in forest because in for forest he will uh, he, he will uh, he will eat me so i is near the the forest i cross and he really is is very big and welcome to europe so uh, he's uh, <laughs> in uh, glina glina 30 kilometer from uh, Velika Kladusha, I go to Karlovac. So uh, it's between uh, Glina and Karlovac. I, I cross a big beer. This is Europe. So uh, charging uh, <laughs> charging a phone in Mosk. So, but Mosk is closed and I charge in, in, uh, in uh, electricity of my neighbors. Thank you, Ziad. Yeah. Maybe we can campaign for Wi-Fi in the forest in the future. <laughs> <laughs> the bears would also appreciate it, probably. Yeah. Exactly. It's, not, it's, it's not only for me. Huh? It's for everybody. And they and they have uh, they have uh, people uh, who uh, what's the name? Wind. Uh, what's the name in English? Uh, the the people who have a gun and he kill uh, animals. Uh, a hunter. A hunter, they have many hunters there and are far right. Huh? What mm. do you? Yes, they, they are. From, it's not far right, really. Far right is uh, is 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 the mentality of uh, of uh, of twentieth century. Is only is not a far right. It's, it's the far right. <laughs> far right. They 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 have they have a military American army in them land and they ask migrant to go uh, outside from from them uh, land this is the far right in europe is stupid so let the others uh, m m uh, military with gun in your in your country after you talk uh, to me to go away outside so it's not a far right it's a joke in 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 the conversation in in uh, in media with far right he he can't stay two minutes uh, in face of me it's not uh, is 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 uh, is <laughs> he they, they, so in 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 Bosnia they talk about uh, refoulement so he take a migrant and he get him in the in the in the plane and he get pushed back in his country in Bosnia so Germany with big money and Switzerland with big money and big uh, and they give money to migrant they, they, Switzerland uh, one day one one uh, one time give 5000 euro to migrant to back home 5000 euro migrant he can take the 5000 more and he go home and he get back a uh, second time but bosnia she can't she can't get back uh, migrant without passport without anything some algerian he say i'm from india so yeah Thank yes. you, Ziad. We yes. need to get through these questions. I think we don't. Have yeah, of course, of time, course. So I will just cut across you quickly. Oh, of course. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, so I will go back to the top of the questions. Um, let's see. So the first one we have is okay for Serbia and Greece. This one is for so Simon and Milica, where you have cases of special forces deployed in camps. Um, how do you see the development of this new behavior in phase two? And will special forces still be present after the emergency has passed? Maybe I can cover the, the, the Greek uh, incidents and militia, so you can come back on the Serbian ones. At least in the camps here, um, the, the pushbacks from, um, from Diavata, this inner city camp close to Thessaloniki, involved uh, a combination of police officers, plainclothes and other. Um, and they, they were then transferred to, to military personnel in the border area. But in the cases of the, the widespread um, beatings that occurred in Drama Paranesti earlier in April, this was uh, riot police who, who carried this out. Um, I, th I suppose the worry with these newly termed pre-removal centres and the fact that people are being detained there um, with little access to, to legal recourses and have been, we've heard reports of them being pushed back from there, um, that these, this kind of violent approach could occur at any moment from the police. 
we've been in touch recently with with four Kurdish activists who are on hunger strike inside uh, Paranesti, who report that regular violence is happening and had happened before the COVID period. It just reached um, a peak with with two interventions by officers there. So I think this this uh, this escalation has definitely paved the way for increased uh, powers for the police. There's also been some legislation changes and uh, specifically around asylum that have come in and, and been more repressive. I think Hope and others that have been tracking uh, detention in Greece for a longer time than myself have, have been made aware of cases of transfers from, from other centres closer to Athens as well to these detention spaces in, in Paranesti and then pushbacks on into Turkey. Um, so there's also this element of, of transfers being carried out by, by police officers between detention spaces uh, and then very, very dubious uh, cross-border removals. Um, so I think for sure the, the expanding powers of the special forces is a concern. Also, we saw squat uh, evictions uh, and pushbacks from inner city, um, in, in, pushbacks that were targeting the inner city homeless population in Thessaloniki around the train station in different areas. And there was definitely, um, you know, a high level of uh, special police forces in, involved in this, or suggestions by by some respondents that that they were involved in in that apprehension. So again, this is this is concerning to see. Uh, and regarding the situation in Serbia, uh, we did not expect um, for this practice to continue after, or at least I did not expect for this practice to continue after the state of emergency was revoked. However, I was wrong. Uh, the army was deployed to guard three camps at the border with Croatia. Uh, there is a family camp in uh, Shid itself, and then two others uh, surround in very uh, close proximity to Shid, Adashetsi, and Printipovat. Um, this is not the job of the army, according to the Serbian legislation. The army, um, it's not their job to anything to be involved in anything related to asylum and refugees. However, our, our president uh, said that uh, citizens of Shid are feeling unsafe. And that's why it is necessary to employ army to guard these camps. Uh, according to the officials that, I mean, according to the official statement of the officers from the commissariat, which is a public institution which runs all the camps, they are saying that at the moment there is around 8,000 people uh, staying in camps. This is only 1,000 less than uh, what it was during the state of emergency. However, this is still a quite high number compared to the previous situation, so compared to the situation before the state of emergency. This probably shows that people in camps are still not allowed to leave and to move freely. We've heard that in some camps, they're allowing only three or four people per day to go out. In some camps, they're forcing them to come back. Uh, there is a lot of police present uh, also in all the cities where there are refugee camps. So it appears that this, this practice will continue. Thanks, guys. We'll move on to the next question I have is um, exactly which countries are employing illegal pushbacks with their government's approval at present? If I may say, uh, from uh, the experience in the past five years, uh, there is a large amount of impunity in all countries perpetrating pushbacks, because if you take into account that, for example, let's use Croatia as an example, 25,000 estimated pushbacks within one year, 20 different police directorates, huge border, and exactly the same procedures, copy-paste procedures, done by 6,000 6, different border guards that are employed to work in the border area. If it were isolated incidents, if there was no order or no system behind it, it would be very hard for me to envision such a, uh, such a phenomenon a phenomenon that would uh, 
have such a large impact to so many people. And that would be exactly the same on all parts of our border. At the same time, you see this copy paste model in Hungary, where it actually originated in our part of the world. Now you see this exactly same model in the Northern Greece. You have it in Poland. You have it in many countries on the outer borders of the EU, but also inside EU, such as Slovenia, for example, which is using the admission, the readmission procedure, which is kind of legal, but at the same time, the way that they are using it, it's very illegal. So I would say, if there was no knowledge of the country, and after five years of warning against this trend, we would already see effective investigation or any investigation in place. Having in mind this very loud silence from the authorities, I can only conclude that either this is the biggest conspiracy theory in history, or there are orders behind it and impunity in all of the states perpetrating pushbacks. Thanks, Milena. Um, if no one else has anything to add, um, there's one to the people in Greece asking if we've encountered testimonies of pushbacks to Turkey of people fleeing Turkey itself, so Turkish political asylum seekers. Um, I personally, having worked in Greece for some time documenting pushbacks, have not come across this phenomenon, but I don't know if you have more to add on that, Simon. Not in the recent um, pushback testimonies we've been taking. Those have been like a, a spread of, of people from North Africa, Palestine, mm -hmm. Syria, Iraq. Although we did, we, we are in contact, as I say, with, with um, Kurdish people who are being detained in um, Paranesti, where they suspect over 100, at least 100 people have been removed and pushed back um, to Turkey by the same mechanism being, I mean, they're in a pre-removal center, but under the terms, the, the current terms with Turkey, there are no readmissions, so there's no legal way for people to be removed there. But riot police have been entering, and also police have been removing people en masse. So I think there's there's definitely people here who are Turkish nationals at risk of pushback. Uh, we haven't encountered them ourselves, but I think that speaks also to the the snapshot that we're taking as as small independent grassroots organisations recording with mainly informal transit populations. Um, but surely this is happening on a, on a wider scale. Yeah, exactly. I would back you on that and just say that just because we're not recording things definitely doesn't mean they're not happening. I mean, the testimonies mostly we're getting in Greece are from the homeless transit community, which tends to be single young men. So maybe from northern African countries. So maybe we haven't observed this trend just because of the sample that we're selecting. So yeah, next question I have is, what do you see the next steps being in the Western Balkans, but also more widely in the region? I don't know if this is next steps regarding BVM or the pandemic. Maybe that's open to interpretation. I mean, I think th certainly Frontex would be one major one. We've seen the recent signing of, of uh, status agreements with some of the non-member states. And I think that will have quite a radical impact. Um, we've seen the, the impact it's having on the, the Greek-Turkish border. Um, and also the surveillance and the st strategic support they've been, been giving to pushbacks from Croatia. So I think these, um, these status agreements, also the fact that new, the new Frontex regulation is allowing officers to be deployed with weapons, immune from domestic courts, in countries such as Albania, Montenegro, Serbia, and Bosnia, it is highly concerning and it speaks to, I suppose, the, the strategy that the European Union has for um, this route and how it will possibly change in the coming years. Um, so the expanding powers for those offices is a big one I think we will have to monitor. It definitely uh, smacks of this kind of neo-colonial approach that the EU uses in border externalization, um, hamstringing, um, non-member states in terms of their accession process to carry out the dirty work of pushbacks. Um, if, you if you think of the route through Albania, that's one that was fairly porous up until recently. Then comes Frontex to implement hardcore illegal practice. 
Um, so I think that's that's probably one of the, the major changes we'll see going through 2020 and 2021. Um, and one that with the new standing course, so this uh, set of um, 10,000 uh, officers that are be ready to be deployed by the by Frontex, um, one that I imagine will grow in presence. At the moment, we see smaller missions of around 50 personnel with extra night vision tech and stuff deployed at these borders. But that's probably set to grow, um, as, you know, given given that we've seen extra personnel sent to Greece um, and that the, the status agreements are now concluded with, with all parties apart from Kosovo. I would also expect uh, more pushbacks in the south, uh, even further from the official borders of the EU. And I think uh, this new employment uh, or deployment of Frontex uh, officers, but also the agreements they signed and they're signing, for example, with countries such as Montenegro, are also saying about, about uh, system that is managed, obviously, from the EU and that actually is in place in the entire Western Balkans. Because what we had in the previous years was a trend of uh, more and more pushbacks from Croatia. But in the last year, you actually saw more and more pushbacks from Bosnia to other countries. And you had Bosnian officials even openly boasting with thousands of people they have returned, you know, like, you know, good soldiers. So in that sense, I'm, I feel that uh, the frontier would go further and further from the country that I'm in now, for example, I think that we will be experiencing even more chain pushbacks like we had when the formal corridor was closing in early 2016. Then it was not unusual to see this mass deportations or mass pushbacks of people from Croatia to Serbia, from Serbia to Macedonia, then Greece. And now we see this trend is on the rise again. So I suppose our activities also would have to move or at least cover a larger area in order to, to be able to track the system. This is what I see that will happen in the following months. It will also be very interesting, I think, to see if the second wave of the pandemic uh, would kick in and how it would reflect to the situation in the Balkans, because not only independent monitors were not able to uh, see what was happening in the field, but also for example, Croatian ombudswoman who has the power to go to field visits and to visit the uh, police uh, stations in the border areas, she was also prevented from doing so because of the pandemic. And I'm afraid that these new measures, even though they probably won't be so harsh because our economies cannot afford a new total lockdown, would have, uh, I would say, severe consequences for the people on the move again. Sorry. <laughs> the next question I have, I think uh, Milena is probably best posed to answer, but if anybody else has any inputs, don't hesitate to jump in. Um, have there been any rulings by the European Court of Human Rights on pushbacks? Yes, this is a sad topic for me, I must say, uh, because uh, European Court for Human Rights was seen as one of the few allies within the European system until recently when they published the ruling in the now infamous NDNT case versus Spain. Uh, this was a case of people who tried to enter Spanish territory in order to ask for asylum. They were pinned on the fence until they clamped down in the end and they were pushed back. Uh, the court argued that uh, the pushback was okay, so to speak, in a very complicated and quite dubious uh, ruling because they didn't use uh, legal points of entry. This is a dangerous precedent because it makes uh, human, basic human rights rather conditional. I can only interpret it uh, as a result of a political influence in the court as well. The court should be the independent institution, but as we all know, there are different political opinions and the different political influences also there, it would be unwise to think that they're completely free of the influence. Uh, what we have now is the case that was built uh, by uh, Center for Peace Studies, Iris Sirius, and the uh, Serbian NGO Asylum Protection Center. 
uh, involving the death of little Medina. Uh, she was a six-year-old girl, Afghan girl, who died minutes after she was pushed back together with her family from Croatia to Serbia. Uh, this case uh, would set a new benchmark, I would say, when it will be published, uh, when the verdict will be published, and it would either provide some hope, at least for the most severe cases, or it would be like a final chapter in diminishing human rights in the EU. And we are looking at this very carefully. We are very concerned about the development. Actually, there are two submissions regarding this case at the European Court for Human Rights. One of them was communicated to our lawyer quite recently. Uh, the one uh, involves pushback and the other relates to the right uh, to life. And uh, I expect this ruling to be out this year. We will see what will happen, but I think uh, if we fail here, if the court fails to recognize grave violations against this family, then we won't have much more to hope for. Okay, I realize we're running over a little, but we still have 50 people watching us and three more questions. So I think if everyone's happy, we'll just get through those. So the first one is from Jack uh, asking, what is the role of technology in the enforcement of EU borders and pushbacks in the Western Balkans? don't know if anyone wants, I know that Jack's just written something on this, so maybe he's the best to answer it, but he yeah, asked I was it, just so. going to say that he's probably the best place to answer. <laughs> I mean, I can speak in a proceed form, um, at least in the, in the creation context, uh, where we've documented like a high number of pushbacks on our database. The majority are, um, we have around 400 or more, more so pushbacks that go to Bosnia and Serbia. And definitely in those cases, we encounter like a high number, which reference the use of detection equipment um, and also uh, the use of equipment in terms of uh, perpetrating violence. So those are seen most keenly through tasers, um, but there's, there's also a range of different um, infrastructure that the officers use. Uh, I think it's interesting to track that a lot of this funding has come through EU money um, that's gone into bolstering the, the border regime there. Uh, definitely a, a large amount of spending has gone into to helicopters, uh, drones, uh, night vision sensors um, that are deployed in the border area close to the Unasana Canton, where the highest volume of crosses are, crossings are occurring. Um, so you see the fact that they're, you know, both on a financial level and also in a personnel level, there's a real uh, effort to uh, fortify that section of the border. Um, so, I, I, and I think I think that's an important thing to note because you know where the, the purse is an interesting <laughs> thing to pursue, and, and we see where if we follow the thread where this money is coming from, it's coming from from top down, and it aligns with um, the manoeuvres and the decisions we're getting from the top of the Commission and the primary states within the EU, which are backing this pushback framework. Uh, interestingly, as well, across the, the rest of the, the Balkan route in Greece, you, you also see the use of um, tech in terms of detection. Um, it, notably, as well, there's like a use of, of technology in terms of fingerprinting and, and things like that. But this obviously doesn't follow the line of uh, asylum law or the way that uh, expressions of intent should uh, be dealt with. So we see a, a high level of mis, mis malpractice um, with the tech that's being deployed that should uh, afford people the right to, to international protection. Um, and generally, we see the use of technology in order to capture people and remove them. Uh, and in the Frontex case, as, as seen in the Operation Poseidon on the Central Med, uh, you've also seen surveillance planes being used uh, to track and identify transit groups who are then pushed back by Croatian authorities. So it, it also implicates uh, multiple parties within, within the pushback regime. Thanks, Simon. Um, go on to our penultimate question. Are legal tools still an option to change policies when national legal frameworks are more and more revised according to EU directives, which do not protect people, but borders? Okay. 
anyone. <laughs> Calling for the lawyers out there. <laughs> yeah, I would say this is Militas, yes. And I'm just yeah. waiting for everyone who wanted to know uh, links to the European Court uh, submissions in the YouTube comments. Great, thanks, Milena. Um, when it comes to the national uh, legal remedies and um, available legal procedures, we haven't had such cases. Uh, our um, uh, legal institutions in terms of asylum are not very effective. The only court that actually goes into, into the essence of asylum, the right to asylum is constitutional court. However, even in this court, we didn't get much um, decisions that could potentially change the policies and practices. Uh, just, an, an, just as an example, um, according to the Serbian law on asylum, refugees, so people who were granted asylum, have a right to refugee passport, which is in line with the Geneva Convention. In practice, Serbian authorities don't issue this passport. There are several uh, initiatives before the constitutional court in, in the cases where people were rejected for refugee passports, and those cases are pending for five or six years. So our courts are neither effective nor do they deal uh, with these cases. So we haven't had any any real change uh, in policies or in practice based on decisions from the courts or other public authorities. Thanks, Militza. Um, so our final question is for Ziad, star of the show. <laughs> um, so uh, the question was, uh, in what ways do you think the migration process is more difficult for people who don't speak English or French? Uh, European uh, population, they don't speak Arabic. They don't speak Urdu. So you have to learn you have to learn English, you have to learn German, because German too, when you, when you, when you ask with English in Frankfurt, he, 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 he answer you in, in, in German, and we know this. So uh, <laughs> uh, you have to learn uh, language. You want to go to Europe, they don't accept uh, someone who fix his uh, electricity with the diploma of, uh, Cameroon or, or uh, no, they don't accept. You have to have a diploma of something to do in Europe. So to learn uh, to have diploma, you have uh, uh, to learn English and especially English and German and French and uh, that's it. So uh, communication, so. Language is uh, is uh, is the first thing. Uh, me, I uh, I found uh, with language, French and uh, English, very easy way. Now I have a girlfriend from Spain, so <laughs> and I <laughs> and I uh, I met her in 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 Velika Kladuja. She did. She don't speak only uh, 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 Spanish and and English, so. Uh, uh, Jesus is a reality <laughs> now, so <laughs> it's not a mythology. <laughs> so that's it. Language is is everything. So the problem is uh, uh, good immigrants. They, he don't go with uh, the 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 Balkans route. He go with visa, he go with plane, he go uh, with uh, program of, uh, of uh, working and uh, uh, Europe uh, accepts always the good uh, thing. Me is a really special case. I was in university, I was, uh, every, but the problem is my country, they don't want uh, people who, uh, 
is is my is is my uh, the I I was uh, stopped in uh, in uh, study after I uh, had uh, problems with uh, politic problems. So when I uh, send my my folder to embassy French embassy, they they didn't accept me uh, the folder because I have two years without make anything so two years in big things is not they don't they didn't make anything is i make many 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 things without without paper so i uh, and uh, so i think when you uh, cross uh, border and you enter to europe first thing is language and they have to learn language. They have, to, and it's not language of street because they have to learn language in school to have work. It's not uh, because we we was in uh, we had the colonization, French colonization in in North Africa, and we talk all French, but the bad French. So if if you <laughs> if you if you listen to Algerian, he talk French in Paris. They say he is migrant. So. <laughs> so they didn't accept his French Thanks. of school and yeah thank you Zian okay so we've gone a little bit over but I hope um, everyone's happy that we managed to answer all their questions I want to say a big thank you to all of you Simon, Milena, Ziad, Milica and Katya um, any other thank business you that you'd like to add quickly before we wrap up I would just like to remind and basically ask everyone uh, to follow our uh, social media on Monday because we will be starting that fundraiser that I've mentioned, which will be used directly to support refugees who are now a threat of becoming homeless in Croatia. So any support, especially from our international friends, would be highly appreciated having in mind that uh, for us in Croatia, it would be rather hard to collect the funds that are needed by ourselves. Thanks, Milena. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We had a great audience in the end, so perfect. Thanks for all the questions. They were really good. They were really pushed the conversation further. So yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, this will hopefully be uploaded. Um, and there will be a space for you to comment. We'll move all the information over to this link. Um, sorry for the technical issues in the beginning. Thanks for sticking around. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.